Well, good morning, everyone. And as Pastor Mark said, and it's in the bulletin, I'm Pastor Flora Hartford. And before moving to Wilmington from Long Island with my husband, Don, who's sitting back there, six months ago, I retired from 15 years of ordained ministry, a second career for me. But for me this morning, it's not only a privilege, but it's a joy to be with you this morning. So the children really helped us out and Pastor Mark really helped us out. So what I'd like to do this morning is I'd like to try a short audience participation game with you this morning. Now, if I were to mention the name of certain disciples, what's the first word that comes into your mind? Okay, let's try it, okay? Now, if I were to mention the name Judas, what would be the first word that comes into your mind? Traitor, traitor right. Many of you would answer traitor, or I heard betrayer, but not all of you. Now, if you were to mention the name Peter, what's the first word associated with Peter? Rock? Anything else? Denier, right. Anything else? I didn't hear that. Fisherman, right. Some might even say leader, but not all of you would say the same word about Peter. Now, how about the brothers James and John, son of Zebedee, the fisherman? Now, that's really a hard one. Right. <laughs> Sons of thunder. Now, how about, now you know with the help of the children, how about I mention the disciple Thomas? What's the first word that comes into your mind? Yeah. Doubter, right. There's little question of disagreement about the word most everyone would say, doubter. So closely have we associated Thomas with this word that we've coined a phrase in our own language to describe him and others as well, Doubting Thomas. But I'm going to ask you today to forget about everything you thought you knew about Thomas. So forget that somewhere along the way you came to believe that Thomas's primary attribute is doubt. Forget that you still think of him as a somewhat inferior disciple. Forget that you're pretty sure that Jesus puts him down in the gospel today for his lack of faith. As the actor Al Pacino would say, forget about it. Forget all about it. Why? Because the opposite is true. When we take a closer look, we realize that Thomas is a practical, concrete sort of guy a realist in my book. Earlier in John's Gospel, Thomas insists that the disciples accompany Jesus when he goes to Bethany to mourn Lazarus' death. Bethany was the town Jesus had left earlier under threat of being stoned to death. Thomas is actually supports Jesus' apparently suicidal plan with Let's all go with him that we may die with him. Now, it takes a real person to say that. That is love there and loyalty, maybe despair, but certainly sacrifice and total commitment. And that brave statement, if you think about it, may explain his later doubts. Even better, in the midst of Jesus' long farewell speech at the Last Supper, Thomas speaks up, cutting right through Jesus' mystical, poetic, and downright confusing language. Jesus assures his friends that, in my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. Where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going, Jesus says. 
To which Thomas replies, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Those are the words of a totally honest man. Thomas is a plain-spoken and gutsy realist. He wants to understand what's going on and to be able to face the situation when it comes up. That's a key to his personality. Thomas is honest, an independent thinker, thoughtful, and not easily trampled. He wouldn't make a confession of faith unless he deeply believed it to be true. So where is Thomas that first Easter evening when the other disciples are hiding in the upper room? The Bible doesn't say. But someone once wrote, there is doubt, there is no doubt, like the doubt of a broken heart. Some people, when they experience sorrow or tragedy, and we all know this, seek the comfort of family and friends, but others prefer to be alone with their thoughts. I think Thomas was like that. If it's true that Thomas realized more than the others what was going to happen to Jesus in Jerusalem, then it may be also true that he was more deeply hurt. Everything he has, he has given to Jesus, and Jesus died. He still loves, he still cares, he still wants to believe, but his heart is broken. We tend to forget that the disciples who did happen to be in the room when Jesus came to the locked doors that first Easter evening also needed to see for themselves. Remember, Jesus' first resurrection appearance just last week was to Mary Magdalene in the garden. But thinking he was the gardener, she didn't recognize him until he spoke her name, Mary. And she answered, teacher, and tried to grab him and touch him. When Jesus instructed her to go and tell, she responded by running to the disciples saying, I have seen the Lord. Now the disciples don't say to her, great Mary, that's amazing. That's wonderful news, we believe you. There's no response to her announcement. Instead, Jesus finds the disciples huddled somewhere with the doors locked for fear that they too would be thrown out of the synagogue, shamed and crucified. And there in that very room, Jesus shows them his hands and feet and side. Every one of Jesus' disciples needed to hear, needed to see, needed to touch him using their human senses. And that's what it means to be human and experience relationships as human beings. A full, intimate, meaningful relationship will encompass the entirety of who we are and what it means to be human. God wants nothing less than this kind of relationship with us. So imagine what Thomas was thinking when Peter declares to him later that Easter night, Thomas, we have seen the Lord. You have seen the Lord, Peter, the guy who said, Let's build three buildings on this mountain. You have seen the Lord, Thomas. I'm sorry. You have seen the Lord, Peter, the same one who said, God forbid, Lord, that death should ever happen to you. You have seen the Lord, Peter, the you shall never wash my feet guy. You have seen the Lord, Peter, the guy who said, I'll never deny you, Jesus. So Thomas was not the only one in this story. 
that had doubts. Like the others, he wanted to see for himself. Jesus didn't express impatience with Thomas's skepticism and his need for something more than the other's word. And Jesus is and always has been in the business of meeting people where they are and always with love and compassion. That's the way Jesus is. That's the way Jesus handles doubt. He gives us what we need. Doubts and uncertainty frighten us. The phone rings. Mom, Dad, I'm in the hospital, but I'm okay. They thought it was a detached retina, but it was a small stroke. Don't worry. I'm okay, really. Fear and uncertainty frighten us. We needed to see our daughter, Devin, touch her, hug her, to really know the truth. Don and I drove from Long Island to North Central Pennsylvania, Devin's first year at college. No phone call would reassure us. We had to see her with our own eyes. Sometimes the demand to see is not doubt, but love. Notice that when Jesus appears in the upper room a second time, Thomas is present. Jesus doesn't scold Thomas, but meets Thomas where he is. He invites Thomas to thrust his hand into his nail wounds and spear hole. John doesn't tell us if Thomas took Jesus up on his invitation. I truly doubt it. When Thomas saw Jesus, he got it. He really got it, declaring, my Lord and my God, the chief confession in John's gospel and one of the highest praises of Jesus in the New Testament. And the words at the end of this scene aren't really about Thomas. They're about us. After all, who are those blessed ones who have not seen and yet have come to believe? They're us, the blessed ones. What happened to Thomas in the upper room is what John hopes will happen to each one of us when we read, when we hear his gospel story. And that's the way most of us have come to believe. We didn't see, we didn't touch, we weren't there. We heard. Someone told us a story in a way that invited us to say yes. We heard someone say something, perhaps a little something, a small something, which spoke to us, as if calling our name from deep within. There was a prayer, a hymn, a passage, a sermon. We heard. And for those times that we needed something else, beyond the verbal, beyond the simple telling of the story, something that looks and feels more like life, Jesus can still give us what we need. In a few minutes, we will be invited to come to the Lord's table, to open our empty hands, to touch, to feel, and to smell, and to taste for ourselves so that we too can say, we have seen the Lord. He is here in our very midst. Alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia, amen.